last night, someone did something to me that was probably the most vicious thing I think anyone has done to me intentionally, maybe in my life. And so when I woke up today, it was so painful just thinking about what had happened that I really felt compelled to meditate more than I would on a normal day. So I've been doing that because this painful thing was so fresh. I found that the meditation was a lot more difficult than it would otherwise be. Things settled down and became a lot easier. But as I was going through that experience, the idea came to my mind that maybe I can make a video about this to share why meditation is difficult and specifically what we can do to help ourselves when that happens. Because when we stick with the meditation, y'all, like the rewards are beyond anything else I've experienced as a human being so far in this life they're they're truly like, monumental i've done 27 ish silent vipassana meditation courses over the last 11 years or so and one of them was a 20-day silent vipassana course that required like years of preparation and i wanted to add my voice to like meditation youtube because the people I see speaking about Vipassana, which is the method the Buddha used to reach enlightenment, they seem to fall into two categories and they're either first timers or monks. I'm hoping that I can help by sharing my thoughts and experiences as a lay person who has had strong inclinations <laughs> toward becoming a nun, but past life work I've done has shown me that it looks like in this lifetime, a big part of my purpose seems to be to help more people learn about seeds. So it can help us get out of the trap of the economic system because the old economic system i think is what's getting in the way of more of us developing in meditation and just generally healing i wanted to mention for people that are interested in astrology that the fact that this person did this hateful thing to me yesterday was so spot on with the transits that are happening and with my birth chart my chiron is in the anoretic degree of taurus the 29th degree so uranus is within orb right now the thing last night was totally unexpected and very much about my value and how i've been treated and sense of worth and i'm a triple aries and so much of this pluto transit through capricorn since 2008 has seemed to be about an experience i'm having that i think many of us are having in which dysfunctional toxic masculine energies in the old systems are really lashing out before they completely break down and that really felt like what last night was it was like a last vicious attack of those energies before they go away and actually that idea of an unhealthy energy like really lashing out before it's forced to leave is very much what makes meditation difficult but i'll share a little bit more about why so if you've been trying to meditate and you just can't get yourself to sit there but you want to you you have the initiative and the volition to give it a good go the first thing to look at to get to the root of why it's difficult is what's called your shila shila is a poly word it means something like morality poly was the language that the buddha spoke and we need to have solid shila as a foundation to even be able to meditate at all in my own life like after i did my first 10 day silent vipassana meditation course i turned 29 while i was there so that was like 11 years ago. And at the time, I was an alcoholic. I had an enormous binge drinking problem. It freaked out people around me all the time. It strained relationships. It was a mess. I found that after I left the 10-day silent course, which had given me enormous benefit, by the way, when I tried to continue meditating, even for a little bit, I just couldn't do it. And I didn't understand why. And it was only later that I learned that it was because my Sheila wasn't solid because I was drunk so much of the time. So to have solid Sheila so that we can meditate, we need a decent base of time spent having taken zero intoxicants. We can't lie or speak untruths. That's a big part of the reason so many of these courses are silent. We need to not engage in sexual misconduct. We can't steal and we can't kill. The Buddha never said that we couldn't eat meat. In fact, the Buddha Kasapa, who was Gautama's predecessor, actually said that eating meat was allowed so long as an animal wasn't expressly killed in order to feed monks. So for those of us living, you know, like in modern times, this tends to be more about like not killing bugs, stuff like that. Once you've had a period of time where you're Sheila has been pretty solid and really a, like a day can make a huge difference then you'll have a good base to begin your meditation practice and from there you can work on the second of the three building blocks which is called samadhi or concentration to build samadhi the buddha taught anapana meditation which is observing the natural breath so any of us can do this at any time you just bring your awareness to your breath and that's it but what you'll start to notice very quickly oftentimes is that your attention immediately wanders to something else so whenever that happens we want to bring our attention back to the breath as soon as we can with equanimity without scolding ourselves or feeling guilty 
or feeling discouraged because it just happens until we've started to train our minds more so. And this is because the point of samadhi is to help us develop what's called one pointedness so that we can point our attention in a single spot which then allows us to penetrate when we're working on the third building block, which is called Panya in Pali, or wisdom, wisdom meditation, insight meditation, Vipassana. So Anapana is a wonderful place to start because it's so accessible because the natural breath is present all the time. We shouldn't try to force the breath at all. It's truly an instance of doing nothing. We're only meant to observe the breath and that's it. And that's a really good practice in an economic structure and a world that is constantly telling us that we need to be taking action and doing. Observing through Anapana and then later through Vipassana helps us get back in balance with the energy of not doing as well, the receptive energy. So as you continue practicing, you can try to sit you know, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, when you're a little more developed for an hour maybe. And every time the mind wanders, bring it back to the natural breath, to the in and the out. And that's it. You'll start to notice that you can do it for longer periods. And eventually you want to try and get to the point where you can do Anapana for a full minute without the mind wandering away. I remember a few years ago, the first time I realized that I could do it for a full hour sit without the mind wandering. And it was just like, whoa, <laughs> like that. It just showed. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have a long way to go in my spiritual development, but truly like seeing where I had started when my mind was so full of traumatic stuff and alcohol abuse to see that I've been able to develop my mind just by doing this was kind of startling, really. And I released so much of the baggage that I was carrying as a result of continuing with that practice. And that's available to all of us if we just continue walking down this path. When the Anapana is hard, like it was for me earlier today, when the mind is especially agitated and maybe you can't even string awareness, you know, two breaths in a row or something. Assuming your Sheila is solid, the reason that that's hard is because of something called Sankara. In like English lay terms, it's sort of like the trauma that we've accumulated and held in the mind-body structure that we haven't yet released. In my case, as another example, the first course that I sat that I mentioned before, I had so much rage coming up, mostly about my like narcissistic father and his abuse, and also about a narcissistic old boyfriend, because like a lot of people who were raised in narcissistic households, who were the scapegoat kid like I was, I ended up dating narcissistic men for many years, because that was just what felt familiar to me growing up in the household that I did. Eventually through Vipassana, I was able to heal and release that pattern. But in that first Vipassana course, all of the anger I had had about that, you know, abuse for years and years, for decades, it was just coming on the surface. And it was kind of just like, wow, I had no idea that much anger was in there. And then something else remarkable happened, which was that, I don't even know, I think it was later in the course, a repressed memory from over 10 years before of being raped by that narcissistic boyfriend came back in. And so then I was experiencing a lot of rage about that. And I later realized, you know, the trauma of that had been, you know, just too much for me to handle when it happened. So my psyche compartmentalized it, split it off until I'd healed enough to be able to look at it again and integrate it and ultimately release it. And then in like, I think my fourth Vipassana course, which was maybe four years later, the memory of the came back in again. And I was astonished to see that the recollection of the events was clear, but nearly all of the negative emotion that I had surrounding the fact that that had happened to me was gone. And it blew my mind because I felt like I understood what forgiveness was for the first time in my life. I grew up in like a Christian household. I knew that the Bible says to forgive, but I remember thinking specifically like how, when someone has done something, you know, just so awful to you. How do you truly forgive and let it go? And through that experience with Vipassana, I saw that that's the way you do it. You do the practice sooner or later, whatever that trauma is. If it's really especially horrible, it may take longer. You eventually release it. And then what's left is the memory of it without any sort of negative associations. And then that's when true forgiveness can happen. Because in the absence of those negative emotions, all that's left is our natural state, which is compassion and love. So when you're trying to do Anapana and it seems especially difficult, these Sankara, these past traumas, they're coming on the surface. 
They're being forced to leave because you've started this practice. They can show up as physical pain sometimes that seems completely inexplicable and not related to the meditation. I used to have a ton of lower back pain that like 11 courses in mostly disappeared. At a lot of courses, you'll see the newer meditators with a ton of cushions to try and figure out a way to get comfortable while they're sitting. But the thing is, all the cushions in the world can't provide comfort because it's actually the Sankara themselves coming on the surface and they don't wanna leave. So as you continue practicing and being a quantumist and they're forced to eventually exit, they'll often be especially harsh and vicious to try and knock you off your meditation practice in a bunch of different ways. It can show up as suddenly thinking that you need to look something up online or suddenly thinking that you need food. It can show up as very heavy sleepiness all of a sudden, more physical pain that doesn't make sense. And doubt can be another way that it shows itself. They're essentially trying to do anything they can to trick us into stopping the meditation so that they stay within the mind-body structure. And I see lots of sometimes even more experienced meditators forgetting that that's the case. And so it's important to come back to that. And if you can just continue, find the breath again, sooner or later, they're going to have to leave and you're going to feel so much lighter when they do. Again, in my own life, like I said, I used to be a drunk, a significantly bad binge drinking problem for probably about 14 years. I got a DUI and had to spend the night in jail at one point. It wasn't good. And it took time. In my case, it took maybe five or so years of practicing Vipassana, maybe six or seven courses, something like that, maybe a little more even. But eventually, the desire to drink left my mind-body apparatus, whatever the structure is, whatever Rachel is, altogether. I've been totally sober for over six years now, and I almost never think about alcohol at all, let alone like crave it. I've even done like clown open mics and stuff in bars. <laughs> fairly recently and you know it was fine I didn't end up getting a drink even though I was like nervous about the performances and whatever too it's just really amazing to see what eventually can come out if we're just able to over time just continue to be persistent with the meditation and when we are able to continue with that persistence the sankara will settle down that's what happened to me this morning as I was doing I did like two hours of meditation earlier today it was difficult especially when I started but as I persisted, it gradually became easier and the time started passing more quickly. The things that were trying to distract me started to quiet down. And then later on, you know, there can be another layer of Sankara, a deeper layer that comes up that produces a similar effect. And we can just continue with our equanimity. We're just observing. It's not meant to be anything that's forced or active at all. It's just something that if we want to, if we want to receive the benefits, we just need to continue to do. And invariably, sooner or later, it'll get better. That's just how it goes. It'll just get better. So finally, I'd mentioned that the third building block is Vipassana or Panya. And I don't think it's helpful to talk about that in this video because I'm a firm believer that it's going to help you the most to go to a course to learn how to do it. The IMC and the Goinka Centers. Both have locations all around the world. The Goinka Centers have like 200 plus locations. Neither center is perfect because they're run by people who are not Buddhas, who are not fully liberated themselves. But the meditation when practiced properly is the most wonderful thing I think a human can find. I'll put the links to both in the description. I'm tearing up because it's just when you meet someone who is developing and moving along in their spiritual path in that pure way, it's a really wonderful, beautiful thing. So I hope that helps at least a little bit in terms of understanding why meditation can seem difficult and gives you some tools to help you continue in those moments where it does feel hard. If you're interested in being a part of ecosystems that are about bringing meditation to more people, the big mission of Seeds is to help us get past the way the old economic system forces most of us to trade our time for money, often working jobs that we hate. Because if you don't have to do that anymore, if you have support through something like Seeds instead, a lot of people are going to be spending more time healing their shit. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I'll catch you next time. Happy meditating.